Hello. Magpie and myself, Blue Wren, are in the village uh, of the Forest and Free Kids. They've been building it this year. And we want to talk to you today a, a little bit about what uh, this forest school is about and the unschooling kids that join it every Monday. So for a whole day, once a week, we have around 15 kids. Uh, sometimes in the school holidays, it, it swells to about 20 kids who come to this forest in Jarrah Mother Country to learn, to experience, to play, um, and to build a community together. Part of that is like physically building in the structures that they are learning to make and in all the emotional ways uh, that they're learning and building interrelations with themselves and with the forest. So we'd like to take you through what our forest school looks like and the things the children are learning through active and direct play. But first, uh, a few words about the forest school, how we set it up. It is a non-monetary uh, school, so um, gifts are certainly desired, but only if there's a capacity to give. Some, some days we get back from, uh, fr from a full day out with the kids and parents have dropped off boxes of different things, home produce and like really useful things. Sometimes our dinner is cooked for us. In the school holidays, when we do take on more children, we do charge a, uh, a low fee of $20. And sometimes that uh, money raising has gone to local projects. Sometimes it just goes back into our household coffers. We also have a scholarship program, mm. so where the families, low-income families, are unable to pay the $20, especially if there's more than one kid, um, then we have other families who pay it forward to cover those costs. Mm. So here is the framework of our philosophy and the way in which we run our school. It's very simple, it's very child-led, and it's very forest-led. So we're really, uh, Magpie and I are really just agents of tuning into to the needs of children and tuning into the needs of the forest and seeing where they come together to create a whole. We've really been influenced by a book called Free to Learn by uh, Peter Gray, who's an evolutionary biologist. And he talks about humans as mammals and how mammals play and how they learn through play. So that has greatly influenced our unschooling or home educa education, community schooling uh, with Woody and also that has greatly informed our uh, bush school philosophy. Just to provide a space or an enable the kids to be in a space and step out of the way. And because kids, like adults, naturally want to play and naturally want to learn and to really focus on the experiential. So this is a school without classroom, like the, the, the forest is our classroom. This is a school without straight rows where the kids don't sit all facing the one way. Mm. They're free to be and explore in a number of different ways. Yeah, and the, one of the, the important things we do at the beginning and the end of each uh, bush school session is to come in, sit in circle. What have we arrived with today? And uh, to practice deep listening, listening to each individual in that circle and at the end of the day what what are we taking home what are, what what are our, what are our thorns and what are our berries what's our learning and one of the really beautiful aspects of the school is that we have our bush names so when we um, arrive at forest and free we call each other by our forest names so blue wren and magpie and woody is blackwood and zero is fox and we have fire, we have tawny frogmouth, we have platypus. platypus, we have rainmaker, we have yabby, mm. we have eagle, we have a whole range and sometimes um, the kids change theirs, you know, they'll have an encounter with a possum and they'll mm. say, I'm brushtail possum and at the check-in and check-out circles it's a way of kids to remind people of what their bush name is and some kids have had their bush name since the very beginning and it's easy to remember but some kids constantly change mm. theirs. So they say, hello, I'm Magpie, and mm. then they'll go on from there with their sharing. And their forest names or bush names, are, our, our forest names or bush names, really are about connecting with more than human consciousness and 
it's a really great way to connect uh, across species and across entities. Mm. So adversity is a really big part of the learning at a post-industrial school like this forest school that we recognize, Magpie and I recognize that all our greatest learnings have come through pain or suffering or adversity or discomfort and we now court discomfort um, to make ourselves uh, aware that we are alive and this is very much in reaction to the dominant culture that is trying to eradicate suffering, eradicate pain and that moves us into the transhumanist AI metaverse kind of world uh, where we can create a fantasy through uh, highly polluting technology to construct um, a non-suffering world and we can try to um, uh, you know trick mor our mortality and that is being pushed by I, I feel uh, people who are not grounded who don't have connection to the living and dying decaying and renewing of, of uh, the biosphere or a biosphere or don't even recognize themselves as a biome that is born that grows that consumes that experiences that uh, at, then starts to decay and then eventually dies in order to make a uh, way for more life to come forward. And this uh, sort of ecological or indigenous wisdom has been subjugated by big tech um, and, you know, the church of neoliberal transhumanism. And so the Forest School is really not a reaction against this, but an actual reclaiming of our ancestral ways of uh, of, of living and of, um, of wisdom. Which is, we have direct contact. It's all about building relationships and as we know from our own lives that we, we learn by making mistakes. We learn experientially, kinesthetically. We're human bodies, we're creatures. So for the kids to embody their learning just seems like such a joyous way to learn and for them to teach themselves. And we had this fire here, there were some rocks um, that were put in it and they exploded. And so that was a really great physical learning for the mm. kids, like, wow, do not put rocks in the, in the fire. Mm. And we also have a saying at Forest and Free that if you haven't been scratched or cut or burned or grazed or uh, pricked then you haven't been in the forest mm. so for you know and sometimes something will happen to a kid and they'll fall into blackberries and then another kid will say well you've been in the forest now and for that to be celebrated mm. and again there's the discomfort that is the, that comes from the teacher where we learn our own boundaries yeah and, and just on that mm. just just on the fire um, exploding we as adults can say to young folk um, if you put a rock on a fire it may well explode and send hot rock into people's bodies and faces um, but unless it actually happens and people experience the the scare of that um, otherwise it's just a telling by an adult so it's our role not to create a kind of chaotic risky environment but but an environment that has a good relationship between safety and risk taking and we really learned that with Woody when he was about eight months old. <clears throat> we put a tea light candle in front of him and we went hot, hot. And then he went to touch the flame and it, he got too close and he started crying. And then he tried it again and the same thing happened. And so we went hot, hot. And so then we never had to put a barrier around our, our wood oven at home because we just went hot once and he instantly knew there was a bodily learning, a mistake had been made, an opportunity for learning had been, had been made. And that really gui has guided us as parents as well as facilitators of this and guides of this bush school. Mm. And as we know in our lives that we don't all learn things at exactly the same time and that there is no standardization. And so when things happen with kids, we see, we see kids learning at a level that feels right for them. Mm. Yeah, and I think another um, fundamental difference between this forest school and industrial schooling 
is that um, we are interested in the whole of the village, the whole of the forest, the whole of the of the child, and so it's not compartmentalized. And so highly abstracted cultures put people and things into parts, and we lose feedback loops. Um, the uh, the rarefication of professions means that we don't have a society of a whole. So we we are improving certain things in modernity while uh, creating this um, that while the same technology uh, in its kind of dual use is creating uh, chaos or um, something really negative and so this uh, this Promethean culture without Epimetheus as the precautionary principle is what we're really trying to change here in this forest school that everyone gets to experience what being a healer is collecting medicines um, showing the kids what medicines are useful everyone gets to be a forager everyone gets to be a hunter everyone gets to be a builder everyone gets to be a musician if they want if they're alive to it and everyone gets to be a storyteller and so this um and and of course as as children become older they 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 head towards areas of expertise, but it's really important that um, at the age group that we run the school, which is eight to 13, that children are generalists. They, are, they understand the world as a whole and they, oper and they, can, they can be across so many uh, different skills, knowledges, wisdoms, and relationships. And that's really critical. And so the culture of parts that is really destroying the planet while making it better in this kind of contradictory force um, is not honored here. And the, uh, the culture of whole, of the whole self, of the whole forest, of the whole village is what we're really trying to amplify. One of the key aspects of this village is only using materials that we have on hand. So we're not bringing in hammers and nails and things like that. So we're using um, just fallen timber. We do have hand saws and secateurs and the kids cut bracken and collect moss to put inside and just make it really home, homely. And there are kids who are interested in the bigger structural aspects of building it and there are kids who are interested in the smaller details. Mm -hmm. And one of the smaller details is we now have a healing centre, a little apothecary, because there are a number of kids who are really interested in um, herbal medicine and when we have last week we had a kid who cut himself with an axe just a, a slight nick and so he he called out to one of the healers and she went and found some plantain gave it to him he chewed it up and he put it on his wound mm -hmm. and just to know that everybody has a role that and that what is around us isn't just a resource to be extracted mm -hmm. that is it is it is something that it is something to be honored and something to be loved mm. and the kids love it when we come to this village if we go on a walk or we play a game earlier in the day just to get the energy moving um, they always call please can we go to the village now so it's really a space that they're creating themselves everyone has a place and a role and mm. yeah I like to um, sit by the fire <laughs> and whittle um, and just sort of go to where go to where I'm called. Mm. And Patrick, you've been really instrumental in with your building skills to help build the, the structural framework. Mm. And it's really great just to see the kids then take that knowledge and mm. um, then apply that to their own cubbies. Yeah. And there's learning cubby, the roofs fall in, you know, they come back one week and mm. you can see there's um, kangaroo droppings nearby and maybe a kangaroo has knocked it, but sort of working, really working um, with this as a as its own little world. Yeah, play occurs in so many ways, and children are just intrinsically natural-born players. And this feeds adults. It feeds me. And when we come home after a day at bush school, um, we just feel light. It's like a medicine day in the forest. We tend to be barefoot all day. We encourage the kids to be barefoot as much as possible. And 
some of the things that we do is uh, give them baskets and ask them to group up in pairs and go and see how many medicinal and food plants and mushrooms and even animal scats if they can identify them um, and bring them back and have a discussion about them. Plantain, there are two uses. We've heard a lot that you can use this as a medicine, chew it up, put it on a cut or a bee sting or a wasp sting or a jack jumper bite. It will alleviate pain, but it is also an antimicrobial, antibacterial. So it actually cleans a wound and it's also a coagulant. So it actually clots blood. So if you're really bleeding hard, you get several leaves, chew them up, break open the mucolaginous gel inside and stick it on the cut and it'll clot your blood very quickly. Stop, nice. it'll stop the, the blood flow. That's a really great way to build knowledges together and to go exploring in the forest and be creatures of place as eaters, as people needing um, to be healed by the forest and as active learners as well. One of the things that's been really stamped out of schools in the last few decades is play fighting, which is particularly um, more relevant to boys perhaps, and not exclusively though. But there is boy energy that loves to orientate and to find out and to push and to play rumble and play fighting is so significant for all mammals. And um, it's, it's been pathologized in the school um, system, unfortunately. It's seen as male aggression or encouraging male aggression. But actually, I believe that the opposite happens, that if boys particularly, not exclusively, learn how to be in a, in a play fight, they are learning skills about protecting themselves. They are learning skills about uh, reactivity and responding. How, if, if they get a knock or if they get put on the ground, how are they going to, to deal with that? They're, it's like, it's such an incredibly important life learning, particularly for boys. If boys can come up against a physical uh, force, a limit, and uh, that limit puts them on the ground, this is not just primitive play. This is highly attuned bodily awareness. Mm. This, this builds an incredible uh, body memory for, uh, for life. And it, it's an absolute travesty that boys and girls are not allowed to play rumble in playgrounds anymore. You know, climbing trees and the, the list goes on and on. But yeah, tree climbing and rumbling is so essential for mammalian learning. And just the way that the older boys have come in and how they facilitate the play fighting and the rumbling is just, it, it's, it just feels like they're, they're really stepping up into that young mentor role. And it's really, there are kids who they try to find their equal rumbling partner. So they can learn their own strength and their own boundaries mm -hmm. and it's just this side of full-blown <laughs> fighting that it's you know they're just learning their boundaries as when you see puppies or mm -hmm. fox cubs um, play fighting it's a beautiful thing to to watch and to behold mm -hmm. and you can see that as they get more confident and they build their skills then they you know try to find the the next partner up who's just a little bit stronger than them mm -hmm. And it's also, I want to say something about the aspect of touch, mm. because touch, mm. it makes us, as we know, when there are little babies, n newborns who are deprived of touch, you know, their vital signs go down. And I think that that's just for kids to touch and to rumble and mm. to play. There's something in that that is the, the, about the physical connection of skin on skin. And the other thing is, rumbling play fighting can release mm. suffering can mm. release pain it can be catharsis without speaking and so that if something's really moving through a child and that child overreacts it comes and and the the play fighting gets out of hand that's not chaos that's actually a, an opportunity to learn and so on a couple of occasions we've held a circle and the learning the deep 
listening and learning that comes from things going over mm. a tipping point. Mm. That is where the gold is. And that's where, so for Magpie and I, it's when do we get out of the road and when do we come in? And so I feel like the role of adults in child learning is that critical awareness. And also the rumbling happens just up here in a place we called Westfield, that the kids have called Westfield. And we can't actually see it from the village. We can hear it, but also for kids to have spaces that are in earshot of adults, but we can't see what's happening. That just feels really important for them to have their space away from us um, where they can just go and experiment and play and of course we can hear that if there are tears and screams we can hear if it's escalating and getting out of hand mm. but just and with that calling a circle if something does get out of hand mm. just the conflict resolution that the kids are learning and sometimes mm. we hear that a circle is being called without us and that is just such a good life skill mm. <clears throat> just feels like yeah the, yeah, just to, to sit in circle, to listen, to facilitate, and there's no interrupting, and to really focus on, okay, this this has happened. From each everybody's experience, they get to tell the story, mm. and, you know, what are we going to do next time to make sure this doesn't happen? So last week, uh, we had an incident happen. So generally, this is the only fire in the village, but last week, some kids had almost completed one of their new cubbies, and some coals were taken from this fire to um, just outside the other cubby. For a housewarming. <laughs> Literally a housewarming. Um, and the fire started to get out of hand. And it's, it's almost winter. We're almost at winter solstice here. Um, so it's not a threat of the whole forest burning down, but it was a really good, it was a really good fright. We all got a bit of a scare. We managed to put it out. And there was one kid who people were going to blame because he had taken on the role of fire keeper and then he had been called away to help harvest some um, timber for just to finish off the cubby and so they all started to blame one another and we called a circle and instead of a he said you said blaming sh naming on shaming naming and blaming we just sat and it's like what is the learning what are we going to make sure that doesn't happen next time so the learnings that came out of it are so if there is a fire keeper that they have to know that, that's that, 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 that that is their role, to agree to that being their role and to make sure that they're around the fire and if they need to go harvest materials or go to the toilet, um, then they need to find a replacement for them to take on that role. Mm. Um, that nothing is to be put on the fire that is greater than the fire, like bigger than the fire, so a log doesn't go across. Mm. Um, to only put really flammable things like leaves and grass on when you're starting the fire with a flint and steel. Mm. And um, that we only have one fire in the village from now on, except that if it's a really cold and drizzly day. Mm. And so the reason that the fire took off was because it, the flame started to go up a western bank that next, was next to the little fire pit and with the afternoon sun, the sun had dried out um, the grasses. So when a wind came and it was a really good learning. And in the checkout, um, the checkout circle at the end, most of the kids said that the, the fire had been a thorn for them, but it was also a berry because the berry was a positive thing because the learning and the, the kids had decided on the fire protocol. It wasn't mm. us guiding it, yeah. that they had come up with that themselves. So that just felt like such good learning. Mm. And just the life skills, not to focus on what has happened, but what am I going to do next? What mm. is the learning that I'm going to take from this situation? Yeah. And in that, I feel like another big difference with industrial um, schooling and the forest school that we're um, creating here is the um, cross intergenerational yeah. or inter-age um, learning that happens. The young kids looking up to the older kids, the older kids taking leadership roles just quite intuitively helping uh, smaller kids up a steep bank or mm. you know just just the, the, the opportunities for kindness and helpfulness with the older kids and Sometimes those older kids create a kind of magic.
Another really important aspect of Forest and Free is the honouring of Mother Country, the awareness uh, of the gifts that flow from Mother Country, the, the materials for life, the songs of the forest birds, the, the protective spaces, the underworlding spaces, the swimmable spaces and fishable spaces, yeah, the abundance of berries, mm. of wild fruits, of wild medicines. And so honouring country, not just acknowledging, but honouring, where acknowledging is just a part, um, is called for at the beginning of each day. Yeah, we say, who is alive to do, to do an honouring of country? And if there is, usually there is, uh, a child who's alive to that and last week we had a child who said I've never done it I'd, I'd like to give it a go mm. and that's just very exciting when you see children step into their next um, level of development and, and that was a challenge for him yeah. yeah it was a personal challenge and I also want to talk mm. about the personal accountability mm. and you know if we're going up a really steep embankment that if a kid asks us to carry a bag or this is heavy or can you, you know, obviously we're going to help if the kid is really in need, but we also say, you know, you have to be responsible. If you've bought too heavy a bag, mm. then that is up to you. This is your learning. And so there's accountability to themselves and accountability to the collective. Yeah, so we're interested to hear um, about what you're doing um, in your communities to raise awareness, uh, to give kids a, a uh, an embodiment with um, their local biomes. We are walking forests and biomes. We are forests of microbes mm -hmm. um, walking within other biomes. And so the technical super organism of industrial neoliberalism is really just a, uh, a fleeting moment in mm -hmm. time. And what really matters is that which changes very little, the fundamentalness of the earth um, and yeah, to recognize the earth as a, as a true mother, as a nurturing, giving, sometimes punishing mother um, who is our main teacher at Forest and Free. That if we can embrace a bit of discomfort, we can actually sing a lot more in life. I just wish I had two hands. A black, probably black rock skink. It's really cool. I was like, what the? What's that?